we live in a diverse culture. It's all around us are people from different countries, different places, backgrounds, people who have different life experiences, even different languages than the ones that we call our own. And this includes different world views. A worldview is your base presumptions about life, how you see life. I read an astonishing story in Francis Beckwith's book, Relativism, Feet Planted Firmly in Mid-Air. And that's a really great title, isn't it? He relates a conversation that he had with a nurse in a doctor's office as he was being prepped for a brief examination. That nurse had no idea what was about to come. And she's just taking his temperature and his pulse and all the things, blood pressure, and he looks over at her and he says, what do you think morality means? And then she, you know, she's messing with all the devices and she says, what do you mean by morality? And then he said simply, the difference between right and wrong. And then she said, she's thinking and trying to come up with something. He said, well, you know, I, is it wrong to murder somebody? Would you say that's wrong? Would you say that's immoral? And then, and then she didn't respond to that right away. And as he's looking at her, she said, wait a minute, I'm thinking, let me be time to think. I'm trying to come up with an answer. And while she paused on the question, he then followed up with this question. Can we say that taking innocent life is morally acceptable? Is it okay to kill somebody who is innocent? And then the nurse answered with this, I guess it depends. Now this is a nurse. And then he said, well, I, let's, let's make it really clear then. Is it wrong to murder somebody who's innocent just for fun. Would it be okay to murder an innocent child just because you want to have fun? You'd find that fun to do. And now the nurse was a little exasperated. And, and you can imagine she would be. You know, she, she was just trying to do her job and she's taking blood pressure and his temperature and she says, well, you know, I wouldn't want them to do that to my child. And then, of course, you'd expect most people would kind of let it drop, but he didn't. And he said, okay, but you've missed my point. Is it objectively wrong? Or is it just a matter of opinion? And then the nurse, after a little bit of thought, replied, people should be allowed to decide for themselves. Now, that's a worldview. I give you that story because I want you to understand what that reveals is the way that nurse thinks about base suppositions, foundational ideas about life, about culture, about morality. And I think that if you want to understand our culture, you have to have some understanding of worldviews. These include modernism and scientism, also, postmodernism and relativism, such as the nurse in the story. And then, of course, what we're living in now is the rise of the new modernism. And modernism said that there are answers to every question in science, modernism and science. And that would have been the early 20th century. Middle 20th century was the rise of postmodernism, which said, no, there are no answers. Relativism said, well, there are no good answers but whatever is good for you is good for you, and you believe that, and I'll believe whatever I want to believe, and that's kind of where we got a lot of this really strange stuff going on, where you have a person saying they're another gender, and that kind of thing. That's out of relativism. But the new modernism now says, no, what I believe is true, and if you don't believe me, then I'm gonna burn down your house, or I'm gonna kill your family. It's got an anger, it's got a hatred to it, that's driving it. That's the new modernism, and that's kind of where we're at. Now, consequently, you look at where our culture is with its worldview, and you throw the Bible into that, where it says, no, there are definite answers, but the answers are found in God's Word. Well, that's a toxic mix. 
that's a that's a situation where you're going to have conflict. The differences become pretty obvious. If you want to know why people are at odds today, and I'm not talking about Christians and non-Christians, I'm just talking about what's going on in our society and in our culture. I can tell you, it's worldviews. And when you add the Bible, the differences become obvious. Now, this is even true when we're dealing with seemingly non-controversial subjects, such as architecture, botany, zoology, urban planning. Things that you'd say, why would anybody disagree over subjects like that? How could they get into an argument and then later into a fight over a subject like botany, flowers, or zoology? And the reason is is because we're now talking about people's base fundamental beliefs, what they believe deep down inside them. Let me give you two examples, actually, that are going to arise later out of our text that are pretty modern, if you think about it. Paul, Paul could be standing here in Cary, North Carolina, and preach this very same message in different places. Atheists deny the existence of God. If you're an atheist botanist, where did that flower come from? Where did it come from? Didn't come from God. He didn't create it. And if you're a Christian botanist and you've just been hired by this company that studies flowers and now you're standing next to an atheist botanist, you're going to have a fundamental different set of beliefs that totally clash. You're both going to look at that flower completely differently than you might otherwise. Or how about Hindus, like live in our society, our culture here, they're the opposite of atheists. They believe in many gods. There are millions of gods. And they see life through that lens. They look at life from that perspective. And these are so different. These different worldviews, that when they come together, they clash. Conflict arises. You know, I, I tell you, I think a lot differently than the average American, primarily because I see life from the perspective that God provides in Scripture. When I look at life, I try to see it from God's perspective. And I think that more and more, as our society leaves traditional Christian values, and more and more as I hopefully think like God thinks, that gap is widening. It, it's getting bigger. And the difference in perspective creates opportunities for conflict. Let me just tell you something. The biggest conflict in our culture is not politics, race, or economics. It's not those things. You're seeing some of that played out this weekend in cities across the United States. But it's not those things. The biggest and most significant difference is between the way the Bible presents God creator, holy, loving, just, etc., and the way the unsaved world thinks about God. That's the thing that's driving this. Friends, do not mistake and take the news at face value. There is an unseen, there is an almost, in many places, unheard of force that's driving the conflict, and, and his name is Satan. And the conflict, the clash that's going on in our culture is the clash between God and Satan being played out on your TV set and on your internet and anywhere else you can see the news. It's, it's true then what A.W. A. W. Tozer wrote. When you think about God, that's the most important thing about you. What you think about when you think about God is really whether or not you're going to have conflict in this world. You know, you can't love and worship God and follow Jesus without there being some conflict. You can't. You, you just can't really be a disciple of Jesus and hope just to kind of have this sweet, calm, peaceable life, especially how we live now. I think uh, the 70s and 80s, and the 60s, by the way, you think what we're going on now, go back and look at what was going on in the 60s. 
is, there's a lot of similarities. There were a lot of riots and burning and stuff going on. You go back and read what happened at Kent State, other places. It was before I was born, stuff going on that was a lot like what's happening today. We're, our world's seen this before. But I think the 70s and 80s and the relative peace in the 90s and even maybe the early 2000s led many people, Christian people, to be lulled into this sense that we could kind of live in society and be peaceful and happy and calm and we never really have to talk about our faith because that makes people upset. We can just kind of live out our faith. We can go to church. We can sit under the pines. We can have a great time. Everything's going to be wonderful and we're all happy and our, our children grow up relatively happy. They all middle class, live a kind of nice life, go to Disney World once a year. Every, everybody's great. And I'm telling you, those days have ended. And don't grieve for them. But those days are over. Walt Disney World, or the Walt Disney Company, just released, Pixar just released a short video where they have now a homosexual character coming out. That's the cartoon. It's supposed to be humorous. And it's evil. It's evil. And the day may come when no Christian will be able to go there anymore. That day may come. And you think, that's radical, Pastor. You're talking, that's crazy talk. Then you're asleep. If you think what I just said is radical, you're asleep. And you don't realize that there's actually conflict going on between God and Satan right here on the ground. Because this is where we live. These fundamental suppositions are in conflict. I, I think there's a reason why Jesus described discipleship as cross-bearing. That doesn't sound middle class, comfortable, easy. Cross-bearing. Jesus said the world's going to hate you because they hated me first. And I don't think that means we should withdraw from the fight. Fear of danger is no answer to the problem in our culture. Actually, if you were following last week's message... I was saying we should be fearless in the fight, but I'm going to take it one step further. In this text, we find something else going on. Instead of Paul letting the fight come to him, Paul takes the fight to them. Instead of Paul responding fearlessly to conflict, Paul goes further and he initiates the conflict. And you'll see that Paul is like a UFC fighter being dropped into a cage in Athens. And that's why I've entitled this message, Encouraging Conflict with Different Worldviews. That's the title, Encouraging Conflict. Faithful Christians battle against spiritual darkness. That's number one. Paul introduced conflict in Athens. He responded emotionally to the evil that was in the city. Look at verse 16. Paul waited in Athens, and his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Now, Athens was just minding its own business, right? I mean, they're just sitting there going, we're just living our life. We got our idols. We got our art. We got our culture. We got our architecture. And it was a beautiful city. It must have been in its glory days from about 400 B.C. to about 480, that 800-year, 900-year period. It must have been absolutely beautiful city. It's minding its own business. The highlight is the Parthenon sitting on the Acropolis, by the way, which means high city. Uh, there above the city is this beautiful ruins you can still see today of this temple dedicated to the goddess Athena, completed in 438 BC. You know, this thing's almost 500 years old by the time the Apostle Paul is standing on Mars Hill. It would have been, in all likelihood, just behind him as he's speaking. Can you imagine him talking about idolatry to a group of people who just over his shoulder can see the Parthenon, can see this temple dedicated to this goddess? And Paul is standing here and he's looking around the town. He just, he's on vacation. He's supposed to be relaxing. He's supposed to be getting a little bit of rest from all this turmoil he's been in, and instead he gets fired up against their idolatry because everywhere he went, there were idols. He went into the marketplace, the Agora, 
which was lined with idols. And then all of the roads going in and out of the city in every direction lined with idols. They said there were maybe in Athens more people than there were idols. I'm sorry, more idols than there were people. I had that the other way around. And Paul sees that and he becomes furious. He just gets really angry. His phrase says, and the King James puts it in such a nice way. It sounds, you know, like he, he, uh, he ever, you ever go into your fridge and you open it up and you think you're grabbing one jar and you grab the wrong thing and spread it on your sandwich or something. So in, instead of ketchup, it's jelly or you, you ever have an experience. If you haven't, you just haven't lived long enough yet. Okay, because you get older, you grab wrong things from time to time, you know, and then you're you get a little upset. That's maybe my spirit was stirred. That's not what this is saying. Think plain, old fashioned, angry. Paul got his Irish up, as they would have said um, back when that was okay to say. He would have been very <laughs> angry, just furious, angry. And he took his argument to the people. He didn't just say, well, you know, that's Athens. What do you expect? That's how people are around here. It says, no, verse 17, therefore, by the way, that word's in your Greek text, and that word means because of what just happened, he disputed. He became really argumentative. I mean, Paul became one of those people that, Sometimes you just don't want to really be around because he's just arguing. Everywhere he goes, he's arguing. In a synagogue, he's arguing with the Jews and the devout persons. And then again, down in the Agora, in the marketplace. And you can go to Athens today and see the ancient Agora. Uh, it's just now just stones on the ground where it would have stood. And you can see that where Paul would have stood and argued with these Greek people in the marketplace. And he disputed, he debated with them. He argued with them. And of course, these philosophers said, hey, this is something new. And so they grabbed Paul, the Epicureans and the Stoics, and they said, we'd like to know more about what you're saying. And they lead him up to Mars Hill. The philosophers lead him to Mars Hill to present his gospel message. He, he set, he set her a forth of strange gods, verse 18, because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. And so the Greek philosophers, these two different camps, totally opposed to one another themselves, wanted to know what Paul had to say. The Epicureans, well, they were the ancient version of our atheists today. They didn't believe in any gods. They didn't believe in anything supernatural. They didn't, they didn't believe in anything that you can't see or touch. That was your Epicureans. Your Stoics were the exact opposite. They were the ones who believed in all the gods. So your Epicureans are kind of happy because they're saying, you know, maybe Paul is is downplaying all these gods that are in, in Athens. And the Stoics are saying, we really want to hear what you say. Maybe we've missed one of the gods. Maybe we've overlooked this god. And so he has an audience. They say, we want to learn more about this strange god, this other god, who is Jesus who rose from the dead. And so at that point, the unbelieving pagans said to Paul, explain yourself. Now I'm going to tell you, for a preacher like Paul, that's wonderful news, right? They're saying, okay, tell us what you think. Now, I've been in situations like this, and I'm going to tell you, just because they want to hear what you think doesn't mean they're going to be happy after you finish talking. You know, you, 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 want, you asked for this. You wanted to hear this. I remember years ago when Johnny's Pizza was down at Apex. They've, they've got one now here over off of High House. But when Johnny's Pizza was in Apex, uh, I, we got to know Johnny. This is back when our building was being built. We got to know Johnny and some of his crew and uh, staff there. And, and uh, I had been going down there for lunch and dinner at different times. And some of, some of you others had been there. And so got to know Johnny and, and uh, personally. And one day I went in there, I was waiting for an, a lunch appointment. And I'm inside Johnny's Pizza. And while I'm waiting, there's nobody there. It's maybe 11.30, and there's nobody in there except Johnny and his, and his workers. And I start talking to Johnny. How are things going? Tell me. And he's standing behind the counter, and he says, Hey, you know, you go to that church, right? You're a pastor. He said, Yes, I am. He said, Could you explain to us what you believe? Could you just, would you be willing to tell me what you believe? I mean, it was that open. And I said, sure. 
I would be glad to. And so I began to preach Jesus and the resurrection. And all of his workers came out from behind the counter and stood there and for about 15 minutes until somebody came in, heard me preach to them Jesus Christ crucified and risen again from the dead. Well, that's what Paul did. They took him, verse 19, brought him to the Areopagus. We want to, we want to know what you speak of, this new doctrine, because that's what they love to do. So they asked Paul about his beliefs. This is different from what we've heard before. What does all this mean? Because they, they weren't particularly interested in Christ. They wasn't saying, hey, we please tell us the gospel. We're desperate to get right with God. They just wanted to know more about this new philosophy. They were debaters. They liked to discuss what was going on in their society. And so Paul takes the gospel to them. And I guess for us, there are a couple very simple applications at this point. And the first would be this. The first application, does it bother you when you see how unsaved people live? Does that really bother you? Does it agitate you? Does it stir up your spirit, to use the phrase from our translation? Do you get angry when you see sin in our culture? Does their pagan lifestyle bother you? Does it bother you that some have rejected Jesus Christ? Does it concern you that they're going to hell? Does it, does it matter to you that they hate God? Does that bother you? And are you willing to argue with them? I once led an evangelistic ministry at George Mason University. Here's what we did. It was a bunch of college students. We would go down to George Mason, and we had gospel tracts, and we would just stand there in the middle of the area where everybody came and got their lunch, and, we, and during their lunch hour, we would pass out gospel tracts to the students. And if they were willing to talk, we would talk. Now, we would come across Christians once in a while. Most of them were unsaved people. And those conversations were almost never pleasant. They were very difficult. These students were nice, as you would expect, but they were not willing to hear that they were sinners and guilty before God and needed a salvation in Jesus. And those conversations that I had with them were just very similar to what Paul is doing here. And it makes me wonder, are you willing to initiate conflict? Are you willing to participate in the debate? Will you be argumentative for the gospel? You think about your neighbors and your co-workers, even the parents of some of your children's friends. Will you take and initiate the gospel conversation? You see, that's what we're talking about here. It's not dealing with conflict as it comes to you. I, th I think we've handled that pretty well so far. It's dealing with conflict when you take and initiate the conflict. When you say to somebody who, I think all of us like people to like us, but when you say, I need to tell you what I believe because it really differs greatly from what you believe, and you take and initiate the conflict, are you willing to be argumentative for the gospel? You see, faithful Christians battle spiritual darkness. And they fight with the light of the gospel. That's point number two. Paul shines gospel light into the darkness of Greek philosophy. Now, he put his message into their context. Do you see that? He stands at Mars Hill, and he sees the men of Athens there, and he says, you know what, you're all really superstitious. Because earlier, when you were having your devotions, I found an altar with an inscription to the unknown God. And I'm going to talk about this unknown God. These were not irreligious people. Look at the terms here. They were superstitious, they were having devotions, and they had an altar to gods. They worshipped many gods. They were not irreligious. They were overly religious. They had an unknown God and worshipped him without any knowledge. Hey, in case we've missed one, but Paul uses that as his context as his springboard to give the gospel. I'm going to make the unknown God known to you. And it says he declared, I declare. And that has the idea of preaching. He says, I'm going to preach to you the gospel of Jesus. And so he explained to them why God is not worshipped 
by pagan practices. Look at verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein. Well, right there, he's given a presupposition that probably was different from what they believed, right? This unknown God that you worship, he made everything in the world. He created all things therein because he's the Lord of heaven and earth. And he does not dwell in really big temples up on high hills. That's not the God. That, that's nothing. The God who made all of this, that God, well, he doesn't live in temples. Neither can he even be worshipped with your hands as though he had anything he needed. Because what does this God do? He gives to everything life, breath, and all things. And he has made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. He created all of you and has determined the times before appointed, the boundaries of your habitation, so that you would seek the Lord. And if happily you might feel after him and find him, because he's not far from every one of us. And even some of your own poets have acknowledged this. We are also his offspring, verse 28. For as much as then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone, graven by art or man's device. Idolatry is evil, friends, because it minimizes God. He's the one who created the world. He's the master, the Lord, the ruler of heaven and earth. And he doesn't live in temples. And you can't create a temple and think somehow God is now pleased, that God is now worshipped, because he created those things. He made them. Do you actually think that you can bring anything to God and God actually have more than what he had before? <laughs> it's impossible. I mean, I, I tell people when my birthday is because I'm not stupid. <laughs> if you like presents, you let people know. And I've got a, a, a platform from which to declare it. It's the, it's the best thing in the world. Let people know when your birthday is. And then maybe they'll buy you a present. And when you get presents, you have more than you had before. But that's not true for God. I could bring God everything I had, every little thing I had, everything. And he wouldn't have one more thing than he had before. Because God created it all. It's all his. The chairs you're sitting on, this desk, these pages, this iPad, the projector, the, the sound system, the clavinova, the grass, the dirt under the grass, the trees over your head, the breeze going by, the oxygen you're breathing out, all of it's his. Even the virus is his. He has it all. It's all his. God is everything. There's nothing that is that God doesn't have, that he doesn't rule, that he doesn't control. All of it's his. So why do you think, Athenians, Paul says, you can bring anything to this God and he would somehow be ingratiated to you and somehow be worshipped by you and somehow be praised by you. Everything on earth is from this unique source. And God established the boundaries of your habitation. He created your life. He created you. And he set up boundaries as to how long you'll live and where you'll live and how you'll live. And by the way, your own poets have acknowledged this. Your own poets in meditating about life, not having any idea of this God I'm talking to you about at all, came to realize we are the offspring of God, that we came from him. And the consequence is that God's supremacy is real and idolatry is evil, that you cannot worship God with material things because when you create God out of gold and you create God out of silver, or stone or some precious jewel as great as you think you are making God you are actually diminishing him that's what you're doing and so Paul says that's not going to work let me give you a better answer and he challenged them to come to faith in Christ the times of this ignorance verse 30 God winked at he overlooked but now 
right now, God commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. The call to faith is predicated on repentance for idolatry. Paul calls them to return away from their worship of false gods. This is true repentance. Stop trying to earn God's favor. This is what happened, by the way, in Thessalonica just a few weeks earlier. These people had turned away from their idols to the living God. Repentance is necessary, Paul says, because a coming judgment is, is here. God commands all men everywhere to repent because he will judge the world and the judge will be Jesus. Paul writes to the Romans in Romans 2 that God will judge the world by the gospel of Jesus and Jesus will be the one by that gospel who judges every man, every person, man and woman will one day stand before Jesus and give an account of his life. You all will. Whether you believe that or not is irrelevant. Whether you believe that or not, you're like the fly who didn't believe in your car. It doesn't matter. Every single person will stand before God, before Jesus. And if it's the Bema seat, the judgment seat, where rewards are given, more the better because you know him as your savior. If it is the great white throne judgment, all the worse because he'll condemn you to an eternal hell. But either way, you will stand before the judge. And so Paul says, why not repent of your idols? Turn from your idols to serve the living God. And he says, I'll prove it to you. He rose from the dead. This God rose again. And everybody's listening to Paul. And you can imagine, just like right here, there was all sorts of varied responses. Some of them, verse 32, when they heard the resurrection of the dead, they laughed. They laughed at him. I hope none of you are laughing at this. Maybe you are in your heart. I don't know. But they, some of them laughed. And others said, well, I don't believe it. But I'd like to hear more. It's kind of interesting. Kind of cool story. It's kind of like the little boy who, in the middle of the sermon, goes, I'm not understanding what the preacher's preaching, so I'm going to read Revelation because it's kind of fun. And some of you have done that. I've seen you doing it. Don't, don't lie. I've seen you. Well, you know, preacher's off on some tangent in Ezekiel. I'm just going to read Revelation. Hoping maybe you'll get something better out of that. Here you have, I'll listen. And Paul said, fine, and he left. You see, they jeered at him. They mocked at him. They threw out the lip. That's what the word means. They actually sneered at him. Paul, you're, you're foolish. You're an idiot. And others said, we're not believers, but we would like to hear more. But then notice, some of them accepted Jesus. Look at verse 34. Look right down in the text. What is verse 34? Some came and glued themselves to him. And they believed. And among was Dionysius. And by the way, where is Dionysius from? He's an Areopagite. It's possible the Dionysius was not even in the marketplace when Paul was preaching the gospel there. That he was just doing his business at home when they brought Paul up to the Areopagus, up to Mars Hill. He lived in that general vicinity. He hears what's going on. He goes over, hears the gospel, and gets saved. And there's a woman named Damaris. And she comes and gets saved. And they glued. That's what the word clave meant. I... I can't think of a worse English word that the translators could have picked than the word cleave because cleave has two definitions. The first word definition for cleave is to split and of course the second definition has to be the opposite of split to glue together. So it either means black or white, up or down. I mean you just can't get a worse word than the word cleave. But this is what the word they use, but it just means glued. They glued themselves to Paul. They grabbed a hold of him. We want to go with you. We want to hear about this Jesus. We want to follow him. We want to become Christians too. The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. And the light of the world is Jesus. Now I've been preaching a short series on Paul's second missionary journey, highlighting the conflicts 
that arise in every place Paul goes on his mission trips. But it's a false assumption to believe that Paul was always innocent of the conflict. I don't mean he was guilty of some crime, but there are situations with Barnabas, situations in Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea, where the conflict came to Paul. But in Athens, Paul went looking for conflict. Paul took the fight to them. Will you shine? Will you shine as light in this world, in your community, in your neighborhood? Will you bring the conflict of the gospel to people who do not believe it so that they can hear the truth that Jesus died and rose again? Will you take it into your office? Will you take it into the public square? And who will be your, your Dionysius? Who will be your Damaris? There are people who've never heard. They don't know the truth. And you can take the gospel to them. Amen. You can bring the conflict to them and praise God for it. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this passage of Scripture. Help us to be more confrontational in a sweet way, in a gentle way, in a kind way with people who do not believe the gospel. Help us, Lord, to be confrontational but kind, to debate but be kind. And I pray, Father, that out of this, we will hear of many in our community who will turn to Jesus because of our gospelizing them. I pray this in his precious name and for his sake. Amen. Good day.